Welcome to Tokyo Wave, recorded in a live studio in Harajuku, Japan, with your hosts, Aaron and Parker. All right, everyone, welcome to episode 48 of Tokyo Wave. We are your hosts, Aaron Randall and Parker Allen. Today, we are joined again by a special guest, Dr. Stephen Nagy. Asian public policy expert, political science professor, and politics commentator. On Tokyo Wave, we bring you weekly updates from our studio in Harajuku. Join us in segments featuring this week's top news, political happenings, business, and other random garbage. Here are this week's top news highlights. Tokyo's COVID-19 state of emergency extended two weeks. Tokyo Electric Power Company eyes $28 million in new funds for nuclear plant village. Two pandas at Tokyo's Ueno Zoo show signs they're ready to mate. This week in Japan. All right, here's our top news item for this week. Tokyo's COVID-19 state of emergency extended two weeks. The Japanese government has extended the COVID-19 state of emergency, covering the Tokyo metropolitan area by two weeks, having decided the situation has not improved enough to end it as planned. The extension to March 21st, which we're right in the middle of now, is the second since Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga declared the emergency in early January and has come as health experts have warned that a premature exit could lead to a resurgence in infections and put further strain on hospitals with less than five months until the Tokyo Olympic Games. Under the state of emergency, residents of Tokyo and neighboring Kanagawa, Chiba, and Saitama prefectures are being asked to refrain from unnecessarily leaving their homes while restaurants and bars must close by 8 p.m. Firms are encouraged to adopt remote working and attendance at large events such as concerts and sports games is capped at 5,000. While the restrictions appear to have been successful in bringing down the number of infections in the metropolitan area, the pace of decline has bottomed out in recent weeks. Tokyo Governor Yuriko Koike, who had been apprehensive toward lifting the emergency as originally scheduled, called the two-week extension a crucial period to prevent a resurgence in infections. Yastoshi Nishimura, the minister in charge of the government's pandemic response, has mentioned plans to expand coronavirus testing and contact tracing to stamp out further outbreaks. Well, all I can say is I hope they don't extend it again. Um, I really want to get out of Tokyo the end of March. That's right, you know, and uh, a lot of people are already talking about uh, Hanami or cherry blossom viewing season. And Governor Koike has already been talking about how she is making steps to close or otherwise discourage areas where cherry blossoms can be viewed in order to stem the spread of further infections. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know, I, I have to admit, um, I've been a little bit checked out the past few days looking at the numbers, but I thought we were on a, a good decline over the past couple weeks. We are, but, you know, the the pace of decline is sort of bottomed out around 200 to 300 new cases per day. And so the government wants to get that daily number below 100 in the Tokyo area. And... That's a very ambitious target, and it's really unknown whether this voluntary state of emergency will succeed in getting the numbers down that low. But they sure are going to try. And uh, apparently, canceling Hanami is also on the menu. Well, we'll just have to wait and see. And up next, TEPCO eyes $28 million in new funds for Nuclear Plant Village. Kyoto News has reported that the Tokyo Electric Power Company is considering providing some 3 billion yen or 28 million USD in additional funding to a northeastern Japan village where it plans to build a new power plant. TEPCO plans to provide the money over the coming five years to maintain good relations with the local government in Higashidori, Aomori Prefecture, the sources said. Plant construction has halted after the 2011 nuclear accident at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant operated by TEPCO. 
The company intends to supply the funds through a joint consultative body it aims to set up together with the village to help revive the local economy with fancy nuclear stuff. But the move could prove controversial given that the utility, effectively nationalized following the nuclear disaster 10 years ago, has been receiving state funds as it faces massive compensation payments and other costs. Despite this severe financial position, in both 2019 and 2020, TEPCO donated some 200 million yen to the village in response to the latter's request. TEPCO started construction of its Higashidori nuclear power plant in January 2011, but suspended work following the Fukushima nuclear disaster, triggered by the devastating earthquake and tsunami. In 2019, TEPCO, together with Chubu Electric Power, And reactor builders Toshiba and Hitachi agreed in principle to jointly develop the nuclear power plant. However, plans have made little progress as heightened safety concerns saw regulations on building nuclear power plants tighten after the Fukushima crisis. Yeah, so they want to build another plant in northeastern Japan. What's the worst that could happen? Forget about it. Here's some money. You know, this is a subject I, I won't touch with a 10 foot pole on.、Um, You know, engineers、uh, really, really like nuclear energy, but you know, we've seen、uh, the devastation that it can cause. So it's really tough. Obviously, Japan uses a lot of electric power, and、mm. with the rise of things like electric cars and all of the devices and server farms that we're required to have in today's digital economy, the need for electric power continues to rise. And nuclear power is a popular source of renewable energy that is a lot more sustainable than traditional methods such as burning gas and coal, which are extremely bad for the environment. So, on one hand, we need the power, and nuclear is a very effective option. But on the other hand, last time I checked, Japan has a lot of those pesky. Earthquakes and tsunamis and other things that nuclear power plants apparently don't like very much. Alright, l and our last news item two pandas at Tokyo's Ueno Zoo show signs they're ready to mate. The Mainichi has reported that a zoo in Tokyo's Taito Ward announced on March the 4th that two giant pandas, Riri and Shin Shin, are displaying signs that they are ready to mate. The zoo has said that it will let the two live in the same place over a short period. If the pandas are seen to practice behavior that show that the time is right. Ueno Zoological Gardens said it has seen Riri, a 15 year old male, urinating upside down and increasing the number of times it left its scent marks since November 2020, which are signs it is ready to mate. Furthermore, the zoo also judged that Shin Shin, a 15 year old female, is nearing heat as she was seen leaving more scent marks and her urine test began showing changes in hormone levels since late February. If a cub is born between Riri and Shin Shin, it will be the first time since they gave birth to Chang Chang, a now three year old female cub. According to the zoo, the breeding season for pandas is usually from February to May, but a female panda is only capable of conceiving a cub for several days once a year. A female panda gives birth to a cub 80 to 200 days after mating. That's a big range. Yeah. <laughs> so the Ueno Zoological Gardens is currently closed for business due to the coronavirus state of emergency. If the two pandas continue to show signs they are ready to mate even after reopening, it will temporarily stop their display. Sexy. <laughs> What's the big deal about pandas anyway, right? Yeah, I mean,、um, you know, there, there's quite a lot of other、uh, mammalian species on the planet that are going extinct. I mean, pandas seem like really high maintenance 80 to 200 days after mating. So, I mean, you've got to think you've got to keep it healthy for 200 days after that. Wow, wow.、Uh, that's quite a lot. Yeah,、I'm, I just can't help but think like the person who made pandas a thing, they must be filthy rich. Oh,、There's、yeah. There's probably some like Chinese panda barons who are like flying around on private jets and enjoying the finest caviar from all of that windfall from the 
pandemonium going on uh, in Asia specifically. We need to get like a domain or something like Panda Merch 2020 or Panda Merch 2022 for the Beijing Olympics. Ooh, Panda Merch. Yeah, dot com. All right. Well, we'll have to cancel Tokyo Wave because we'll be busy on our private panda jets. All right. And coming up next, we have a special interview with Dr. Stephen Nagy, Asian public policy expert, political science professor, and politics commentator. You're now listening to Tokyo Wave. Originally from Calgary, Canada, Dr. Stephen Nagy provides macro-level geopolitical analysis on trends in the region to businesses, governments, and the media. Stephen is a frequent commentator on political, economic, and security issues in East Asian politics and international relations in Japanese and international media outlets, such as the New York Times, South China Morning Post, the Japan Times, the National Post, CNBC, Al Jazeera, Channel News Asia, and Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Stephen is a senior associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Studies at International Christian University in Tokyo. He obtained his PhD in international relations from Waseda University. So, Stephen, thank you so much for coming back on Tokyo Wave. I think this is your third time now. Third time's a charm. Thanks for having me, guys. So, let's get started. And we really can't talk this week without being reminded that it is the 10-year anniversary of the March 11, 2011 Tohoku earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster. Stephen, where were you 10 years ago? I was in Hong Kong. I was teaching at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and I remember being in my office and my Japanese coworker came in and said, did you see the tsunami that came into uh, the Tohoku area? And of course, we YouTubed it and it was shocking to see cars floating into communities and uh, float, floating over the tsunami dikes. And I think at that stage, we, we just had no idea of the scale of the uh, tsunami um, and what would be its impact on, on Japan, on, on the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear power plant and really the, the broader trends of nuclear power in Japan and, and globally. It was, it, was, it was stunning. Aaron, where were you on 311? I was going to uh, Universal Studios Islands of Adventure with a bunch of Japanese friends that were studying abroad in Florida at the time. And I was actually planning to go to Japan uh, just a few months later. So yeah, that day sucked and the following couple months sucked because I thought I wasn't going to be able to come to Japan for the first time ever. Luckily, I did. Uh, but yeah, I, I was not here when you guys were here during the uh, disaster. So actually, I was very much in Japan. Uh, specifically, I was at the Makuhari Mese Convention Center in Chiba. And while that was far away from the epicenter, it was about a Shindo 6 on the scale, which in layman's terms is really damn scary stuff. In addition, while I didn't know it at the time because I'd never really thought about it, Makuhari is built on reclaimed land. And the Makuhari Mese Convention Center is a very big, old, concrete building. And when you have a big, old, concrete building on reclaimed land, it shakes really, really bad. What kind of shake was it? Was it like one of the wavy shakes or the, the ones that vibrate or that big thump? Because I think different earthquakes have different feelings, right? Well, you mentioned you were at Universal Studios. You know those rides where you get in and you're like moving around and it starts like shaking really bad. And it's like one of those 3D attraction tours that used to be really popular like 10, 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. They, like uh, they used to have Back to the Future and there's a new Star Wars ride that's like that. Yeah, exactly. It was like being in that, but in real life. Yikes. And then beyond that, it was it was really trippy because we were actually in this big trade show mm -hmm. and, you know, it's a big trade show. So, you know, everybody's got these booths set up and booths are not constructed particularly in a sturdy manner. So mm -hmm. there were like all of these products on the booth and it was actually funny. I went to look at furniture. There's a big furniture fair in another one of the convention halls. But as we were leaving, I saw a bunch of people with these massive swag bags and I was like, ooh, swag. Let's go check that out. So we went over to the Japan International Drugstore Fair 
and pretended like we were, you know, drugstore people looking to buy some new soap and the free samples were insane. And so, you know, we were like getting all these free samples of soap and dishwasher liquid and like all these beauty products. And we were actually at the Shiseido booth where they were giving away free sunscreen and sunscreen in this country is super expensive. So we were going to get like 50 bucks worth of free sunscreen. And so we were actually watching this really boring presentation because you had to watch the presentation to get the free sunscreen. And like right towards the end of the presentation, all of a sudden, it just started shaking like crazy and Whoa. people were screaming and these mm. products and shells were going left and right and it was the scariest shit I had ever experienced in my entire life. I bet. And so when the shaking stopped, the first thing that I did was call my parents. This was before all the phones stopped working. So I mm. called my parents. I'm like, there was a big earthquake. I'm not dead. Bye. <laughs> I don't think they enjoyed that very much, but uh, they knew I was not dead. Yeah. And so after that happened, my friends were like, all right, time to get the free sample. And I'm no, 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 no. Hell no. We're getting out of here. And we went straight to the car. We got in the car and we started to get out at the same time as the other tens of thousands of people who dropped whatever they were doing and decided to go check on their family members. Mm. And at this point, I realized that the traffic in Tokyo isn't that bad during a normal situation, but the trip from Makuhari in Chiba back to Yoyogi, where I lived at the time, which usually takes about 45 minutes, on 311 took about nine hours. Mm, mm, And this is before, you know, smartphones and everybody, you know, having all of these apps that tell you what's going on. So we didn't know if there was a tsunami coming and we were all going to die and, you know, what was going to happen to the country. And then we, you know, it was still like the I mode stuff. So we were like scrolling on our phones, trying to like figure out what's going on. And Mm. people were talking about this nuclear thing and it was like, what is going on? Yeah. And then yeah. finally you know, we got home at like, I got home at like uh midnight mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you know, we actually had to, the expressways close. So when we finally got to uh, Tokyo, I had to drive through Ginza to get to Yoyogi, which was also, you know, totally back to back. So it was like moving very slowly mm-hmm. and there's all these people walking on the street and there were lines in front of phone booths, people trying to call. Uh, it was. It, it felt like being in the fifties because there were all these <laughs> people walking, and it was still cold outside. Everybody's got their coat on. It was. It was surreal. I bet. I, I mean, you just can't imagine something like that in in Tokyo until it happens. Mm. And you know, we're so dependent on our phones and the trains. And you know, I talked to so many of my friends, and you know, they had to walk for like 10 hours to get back to wherever they were living at the time. And they couldn't call their, their family or friends as well. I mean, it really disrupted everything about modern life in Tokyo. All the things that we love and enjoy um, didn't work. It didn't. And, uh, you know, in the months following, I was uh, a student at Sofia University and all of the other international students went home because yeah. mm. you know, there was all this panic about the nuclear disaster. The and fly genes, were, right? Yeah, the fly genes. So I was the only gaijin that I knew who stayed other than like two or three other people for about six months. And, uh, you know, lots of people, people I didn't even really know that well, were messaging me on Facebook and saying, you have to come home right now. Japan's flooding. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I don't want to be labeled as a chicken shit by all my friends. So I'm not going to leave. And I'm still here. So. Yeah, you know, f- when I was in Hong Kong at the time, I just remember how much misinformation was hap- was was out there about what was happening in Japan. Um, you know, nuclear meltdown, Chernobyl, second Chernobyl, Japan's Chernobyl, um, and you know the the people in Hong Kong and and, and China were they were buying iodine and things because they thought that was a way to prevent radiation from coming in, and of course they stopped. Um, importing Japanese products, which is a big deal in a place like Hong Kong because, you know, they just love Japan and Japanese products. And the media just kept coming to my office and trying to to ask me, you know, what was the press saying? Because, you know, there's not that many people that read Japanese fluently there. And they they were asking me, does this mean that the government's going to evacuate? Does this mean Tokyo's going to evacuate? And, you know, it was, I felt like the, the media was 
pushing a story, it's pushing a disaster and pushing, you know, uh, Japan is doomed kind of narrative without really thinking about the facts and, and looking at this more cool headedly. It was fascinating to be part of. And, and there was this kind of nationalist tend that, you know, I think some of them wanted Japan to uh, Japan Eganim. Is that how you say it? Japan plus Argumentum. Um, that was really, really interesting to, 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 to listen to and, and hear. And others thought, yeah, this is great, you know. Japan deserves this. And then others are really sympathetic. And, you know, people from Hong Kong, China, Korea, Taiwan, they, they sent money, they sent rescuers, they sent um, oil and, and blankets and food. I mean, there's such a mixed amount of, of reactions to how neighbors were thinking about Japan at the time. And, and, and the historical context is amazing. Um, yeah, this is this is 2011. It's just after the, the Japanese arrested that fisherman around the Senkaku Islands and the the Japan-China relations were at record lows. Um, we had the Korean president visit the, the Takashima Islands and, you know, the, the um, Japan-Korea relations were at record lows. But after Fukushima, well, we saw, you know, the, the prime minister of, of China and the president of, of, of Korea visit Fukushima area. So it's interesting, all the dynamics, um, good, bad, and ugly. Yeah, you know, I remember being in Florida at the time and I was scheduled to come to Japan two months later. So I was very, very cautiously watching, uh, uh, the TV and they were broadcasting, uh, NHK in Japanese on, I think it was like MSNBC, one of the like a hundred something channels. And I had friends, uh, from Japan in Orlando at the time and everyone was having a very difficult time trying to figure out what was going on, especially with the nuclear power plant. Um, even my Japanese friends, you know, uh, I I think this was a thing very common, right? The communication at the time was really bad from the government and from, uh, TEPCO. Right. But I I just remember for like a month, like nobody knew how bad it was, you know, can, can they, can they go back to Japan? I think they were, some of them were talking about staying in the States for a little while longer, if it was really as bad as, um, some sources were saying. So there was, yeah, mass misinformation as well. Right. There's mass information, but I think there was also groups that jumped on this as an opportunity to promote their particular agenda, whether it's the, you know, anti-base or anti-US alliance um, groups or the people that were anti-nuclear weapon groups. Mm. They all jumped on board um, following 311 to try and push their own agenda. And I I find that really interesting as a political scientist, how crisis is often um, exploited by different groups to pursue their own agenda. Well, it's also, it kind of reminds me of the situation we're in right now, actually, because right after the triple disaster, there was this thing called the Jishuku mood or the kind of self-restraint mood. So people were not going out. They weren't going out to eat. They weren't going out to have fun. A lot of people were paranoid about the possibility of some kind of nuclear, you know, radiation being in the air. And so it was actually, uh, I'm going to sound flippant saying this, but it was the best Hanami ever because a lot of the people were too scared to come out. So I lived right next to Yogi Park. I was out in the park every day. It was empty. It was great. Yeah, I I, I came back to Japan in March that year and then uh, June and July, August and September. And, you know, I remember walking through Ginza on a Saturday night and it was completely empty. Um, or going to parks like you and, and say there was just a few local people and not that many. And, and you know, the, it, there's a lot of similarities to, in particular, I think the, the first six months or five months of the Corona crisis where people didn't know what was the appropriate way to, to manage this and to balance the, you know, the crisis, if it's a crisis and, and, and real life. I mean, maybe the events of 311 put Japan in a better position to be a little bit more prepared than other countries. I think like it this? definitely has something to do with it. And you really can't talk about 311 without also talking about how it affected Japanese politics. Because at the time, we had a government led by the, at the time, Democratic Party of Japan. And the Democratic Party of Japan, up until the disaster, had been very standoffish in its relationship with the traditionally conservative Japanese bureaucracy. And one of the biggest problems that faced the government after the crisis was this lack of communication between the politicians and the bureaucracy and how they tried to very quickly 
cobble together policies for the disaster relief and handling the nuclear situation and communicating all of this to the outside world and, of course, to the citizens of Japan. And overall, they did a pretty shitty job. Yeah, but I think that's an experience of the DPJ in general in, in terms of government. And, you know, Japan, the LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party, has been in power for most of the past 70 years, right? Um, and they're very experienced working with the bureaucracies. So they have the pipelines, that's the expression, um, to be able to leverage whatever human capitals in those organizations to create policies and find solutions. And I just don't think the DPJ had that deep bench that they could um, draw upon to find, you know, practical solutions to a novel crisis like the the Daiichi nuclear accident. And, and that's really, really critical, right? To be able to draw upon expertise. I think they also found out how important the U.S.-Japan alliance was. Um, you know, Operation Tomodachi, for our friends that don't speak Japanese, that means Operation Friendship, right? It was the Americans came in, they brought their aircraft carriers, they flew in blankets and, and food, and they dropped it all off. They used their technologies to go into the Fukushima Daiichi plant itself. The, a lot of the robots that were used in in Iraq um, to, to deal with... Um, uh, well, I can't remember what they were called. I, IUDs or oh, I, IEDs. IEDs. IED is the thing that prevents pregnancy. Oh, well, <laughs> okay. Not IUDs. Or I must be having a, a Freudian slip here. But these devices that were used as explosive um, to explosives against uh, U.S. troops. Well, the robots that were designed there to find these IEDs were used in the Fukushima um, nuclear power plant to find out what was happening inside. They had the cameras. They had the sound equipment. Um, and it really showed how important that alliance is. And it's not just, uh, you know, fighting pirates in the South China Sea or the East China Sea. It's about dealing with um, regional challenges such as a, a, a nuclear crisis or others. Yeah, it was definitely the first time in my lifetime that I thought, gee, thanks, U.S. military industrial complex. You're awesome. Yeah, but also I think the Japanese themselves, they started to recognize the importance of the, the um, self-defense forces. You know, in, in a place like Japan, we don't see the self-defense forces. It's something that, you know, is either um, tarred with this kind of negative militarism kind of view by certain groups in Japan, or, um, you know, the kind of seen as cuddly uh, people that wear uniforms. And I think um, at 311, the self-defense forces have came out and they, you know, provided some goods to ordinary um, Japanese people up in the Tohoku area. And I think that changed some of their image. And we've seen more of that, right? Uh, the earthquake in Kumamoto, um, the floods last year in Kyushu as well, the self-defense forces got out. And I think it's somewhat changed and softened their image for ordinary Japanese. No, definitely. I think that the JSDF really saved Japan's bacon in the earthquake and tsunami disaster. And as a result, I think uh, it must have helped their recruitment efforts as well. Yeah, I think they did a great job. But the reality is we still have a problem in Fukushima. You know, it's called the uh, Kokunai Nammin, the domestic refugees. There's still a community of people that are living in uh, makeshift housing. It's pretty nice makeshift housing, I, I have to say, but they're not able to go back to their, their local homes in, in and around the, the, the power plant itself and the most dangerous part of the Fukushima area. Um, you know, they've lost everything. They've lost their identity, their homelands, their family graves. Um, how Japan's going to deal with that, um, the reality is they're still dealing with it, and, and we're not sure how it's going to move forward. And you reminded me that a lot of people think about the area around Fukushima and the people who were displaced, but it's not just Fukushima. Really, all of these tsunami-devastated communities across Miyagi, Iwate prefectures, Aomori, and these entire communities were wiped out. And if you go there today, you can go there and check it out, it's still empty. And all of those people who were displaced, you know, they weren't rich. So they're still in, you know, housing that was created for disaster victims. And they really can't move out because, you know, what money are they going to use to build a new house with? And where? Because now they know that the community that they had lived in is at extreme risk of another tsunami. Yeah, I, I just don't think there's a perfect solution here, though, Parker, um, for the for the government. I think, you know, they, the, these, they can rebuild the community with the buildings and schools. But, you know, communities are organic, right? They, they grow over 
decades. And, and in the case of Japan, some of these communities are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years old. So how do you replace that? Because you know, in Japan, local identity is everything, right? You know, the expression is, watashi no shushin, right? Um, where is my local town, right? That always comes first. And I think that how a Japanese government, whether it's this one or another, find a solution to that is really, really, really challenging to rebuilding that organic community. And I, I think that they, they haven't done the best job, but I think the problem is just so complex. It really is. And there is no perfect solution. And, you know, 10 years later, I think at the time, the government was really promoting all of these different initiatives and lots of companies were coming in and donating this and that to sort of rebuild these communities. But 10 years later, I can tell you from, you know, going there and looking at what's happened, it's going to be decades. I mean, and of course, the communities are not going to be built back better to use a uh, popular Americanism. But uh it's just going to be different. Yeah, I think that's that's actually it. it's not built back better. It's it's built different, and it'll be a new community and new personal connections. And um, maybe there's some hope to build a, a more inclusive Japanese identity and community moving forward. But um, I've just I haven't been on the ground in a while to kind of see how that's working. And I do know there's quite a few. Um, really proactive uh, scholars that are working on this. They go up to Toku, whether it's, I think, a lot of professors from Sofia University, my university, Waseda, and others are up there trying to recreate the communities and rethink communities. Um, but um, as you said, we'll see in decades. So just one question for you guys on the subject. Um, I have a lot of Japanese friends who uh, believe there's not enough uh, visibility on this issue in the media here in Japan and internationally. And they were really upset when Japan bid for the, uh, what they won the bid for the Olympics in 2013, right? So that's just two years after the disaster when you've got all these displaced communities, displaced families. Do you guys believe that, uh, there's not enough attention on this in the media or maybe the government and the media are trying to shun it and not shine line on it purposely? It's complex. We have new problems today. We have Corona. We have uh, a more assertive neighbor. We have missiles flying over from North Korea. So I think there's different problems. Um, I think that big picture, and you know, if you do any kind of research and you read the stuff by some some empirical based scientists, they said Japan did pretty well, right? Um, you know, they they managed to, and especially if you compare it to the Kobe earthquake, where food rotted at the airports and and medicine went bad at the airports. Well. In this particular case, we saw food come in, medicine come in, um, international cooperation was um, was promoted, and, and I think it was pretty successful. Um, big picture, Japan's probably in a better place today, but at the local level, you know, as you said, those communities... They haven't they, they haven't found a way to rebuild those communities if that is possible and find you know jobs that bring dignity to those people. Um, and if that can happen, I think the story will be a bit better. So I, I don't think it's as, as, as cut and dry as saying they're hiding this problem or not. I think that there's a big picture issue and then there's a local issue um, that is brought, become much more complex by, you know, a real changed, changed world since 2011. You know, thinking about what's going on in Tohoku 10 years after the 2011 disaster, the way I look at it is that, you know, Tohoku had been ignored as a region since before the disaster happened. And Tohoku really never received the spotlight as a place to go or a place to live. And also in terms of tourism and the money that comes from tourism, if you look at a heat map of Japan, Tohoku is really the darkest place where foreign tourists are not going to. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, the industry in Tohoku was stunted. And originally, the Tohoku region, especially along the coastline, had a very large fishing business and fishing industry. And that, of course, was still going on, but severely impacted by the events of 2011 but even before that, there was also a lot of industry around coal and gas refineries and a lot of mining operations that uh, went away as Japan's 
focus on industry shifted. And so a lot of the industry that was in Tohoku had already started to go away. And so the industry had left, the tourism was never really there. And the only thing left was really the fishing business. And then the triple disaster happened mm. and basically ruined that. And so, of course, it's come back to some degree, but, you know, 15,000 people lost their lives. And mm -hmm. the businesses that existed were all washed away with the tsunami. So, I mean, it's hard to say exactly how many were gone and then how many came back, but it's definitely not the same number. So when you look at the future of Tohoku and especially these coastal areas, you really have to put it into perspective that the livelihoods of these people were impacted, their communities were washed away, and with some exception, there wasn't a whole lot of impetus or ability for these communities to rebound. And this was compounded with this, this overarching problem of Japan's aging society, and these communities were already aging, and, they're, and the young people were leaving overwhelmingly to move to Tokyo and metropolitan areas for mm. college and work. And so the the story always goes that, you know, the kids go to college in Tokyo and never come back. Mm -hmm. And so with the focus on success and how success is viewed in Japanese society as working at a big company and living in Tokyo or Osaka or Fukuoka, the idea of living in Tohoku is looked down upon as inferior to the living in the city lifestyle. So with the COVID pandemic affecting the Japanese metropolitan areas the worst, there are people saying that this actually could be the thing that triggers people who are from Tohoku or feel some connection to Tohoku to move back there. Mm, but mm, mm. they can do that. But what are they going to do there? Because the industry is gone. The communities are old. And their infrastructure to support young people moving back is there, but very nascent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so without some greater movement to regenerate and kind of revive these communities in Tohoku, there might be people who want to do something, but there isn't a whole lot of ability for them to do that. The infrastructure just isn't there. And so, I mean, I guess the media conversation around that is all but gone from existence, you know, forgotten about in the, uh, basically five years past the disaster, people just got tired of talking about it. Yeah. And it's, um, it's not a happy story, right? Uh, this Parker mentioned, you know, demographics, uh, the 311 now COVID broader trends for young people to move into the city. So we've seen like, a an erosion of their basic infrastructure and their civil society over decades. Um, so I guess the question is when you're or when you're raising that question is how can we revive these communities? In reality, they were already falling apart from within, and you know, three eleven and now COVID has probably pushed it over, pushed it beyond that limit. So like moving, I guess the question or the the point is is how do we move forward? Mm. How do we create communities rather than rebuild communities? Um, and then what is the necessary kind of infrastructure to create another community in those areas? And, and schools is, of course, important. Um, now, I think, without a doubt, telework does work. And there's opportunities for telework to um, help, re uh, help create communities where people work from, the, from in the region. Um, but it's more than just working, right? You need restaurants, you need entertainment, you need schools for kids and uh, nursery schools and all these things it's it's such a complex problem and you know is there a template do we just create another city build building uh, build buildings and schools and move people in mm, you got to create more incentive than just building you know, the hard infrastructure definitely well and i think you know people always like to point fingers at the government and say they didn't do enough or they should be doing more but uh it's not that it's this is definitely not a problem that the government can solve in a vacuum. And it really requires that sort of organic development in order to build something that people are going to see and say, okay, this community is viable. I can live here. I can grow my family here. Yeah. And it's probably changing values, right? 
um, you know, if, if you've, you, know, you went to Sophia University, I went to Waseda University, and you know the, the pride and uh, how those universities give you a certain social capital in Japanese society. And, you know, if there's no, nothing in Tohoku that is equivalent. Maybe uh, Tohoku University, right, in Sendai. Um, but, you know, you have, to be rebuild, you have to create new social capital and new values for people to start to create communities that will be sustainable. And um, I don't think there's a perfect solution. One note for our listeners, uh, I think earlier I was talking about how mm-hmm. the number of people who are visiting Tohoku as tourists uh, are extremely low compared to any of the other regions of Japan. But that's not to say that there's nothing to see. Actually, the Tohoku region is beautiful and there are countless amazing attractions to go and check out and enjoy. So obviously, this is probably not the best time to be traveling from one of Japan's metropolitan areas or overseas to go and check out Tohoku. In fact, right now, uh, if you're overseas, you literally can't come into Japan as a tourist. But once things are back to normal, it is a really cool place to check out and also Really, it is the antithesis of the, you know, Kyoto inundated with tourists kind of situation where if you are a tourist in Tohoku, uh, you know, you really can experience the traditional way of life and atmosphere in Japan and really feel like you're connected with the community and connected with nature a lot more than one of the more traditional tourist areas around Japan. So, I invite everyone to go check it out. Uh, I spent some time in Tono in Iwachi Prefecture when I was in high school, and it was an experience that changed my life. Yeah, I, I totally agree. There's so much to see in the Tohoku area. And if you don't understand Japanese, Tohoku means northeastern part of Japan, right? And um, northwestern part of Japan is great too. But um, the whole area is just full of nature. There's a lot of uh, temples and shrines and, and communities with local foods and local cultures that um, you just don't see in Tokyo. Um, so yeah, it's a great place to, to visit when, and should be on your tourist uh, or your, your bucket list if, you, if you're visiting Japan. So Stephen, recently you hosted a webinar with the Canadian Global Affairs Institute on Canadian and Japanese free and open Indo-Pacific visions. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we uh, we we organized this event through um, the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, and we brought in um, five scholars, including myself, that are familiar with this idea of free and open Indo-Pacific vision. And this idea, we'll call it FOIP, right? F O I P. Um, the Japanese came up with it in 2017, and it was a, a kind of a a vision of how to ensure that the region remains free and open. And you probably say, what does that mean? So free means trade is free. Uh, the cyber world, the digital economy is free. Sea lanes of communications where, you know, um, ships sail to transport energies and exports and imports, they can move freely. Um, and the oh, and it's also really focused about this idea of what rules-based behavior in these areas. And we're having real problems with that, right? We have really problems with some countries building islands in the South China Sea, or um, now, you know, we have authoritarian tilts in Manila, in in the Philippines. We have a a coup in Myanmar. We have a military government in Thailand. You know, it's not looking good for liberal values. So democratic values, rules-based systems. Um, And Japan's, you know, post-World War II history is, And its prosperity has been really based on being in a rules-based system that was propped up by the United States. Well, that's breaking down as I think uh, China reemerges as a really critical and important and and big power in the region. As uh, as I mentioned, some of the countries in Southeast Asia are challenging those liberal values with tilting towards authoritarianism. And of course, North Korea, weapons proliferating, creating nuclear weapons. So the Japanese wanted to make sure that they support a rules-based system, because if we don't play, if we don't have rules, um, how do you play trade? How do you, how do you engage in in most of the um, intercourse that goes on between countries? We held this event to see what Canada could learn from Japan's FOAP vision, and myself, uh, Jonathan Brookshire Miller from the McDonald Laurier Institute, and um, Cleo Pascal from the 
Foundation for D Defense of Democracy spoke on the Canadian side, um, talking about why the free and open Indo-Pacific concept is important, um, how Canada should understand this, and what are some concrete areas where Canada can engage and, and help support this concept within the region. That doesn't mean copy the Japanese. What it means is, is find ways to contribute and, and develop synergies in this core area of promoting a free and open region based on rules-based behavior. Well, I think a lot of people might hear Canada and think, wait a second, Canada is not in Asia. But I would imagine that Canada does a lot of trade with Asia. So it is extremely important for Canadian foreign policy to be plugged into this concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific region. Absolutely. And you see things like the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. So Canada and Japan are, are both part of this agreement. And it focuses on intellectual property rights, environmental law, labor law, uh, limited role for state or enterprises. These are really important, all right? And, and why it's important? Because if we don't protect intellectual property rights, we're not going to, uh, businesses aren't going to invest in research and development. They're not going to innovate and they're not going to create the next economy. If labor law and environmental law is not strict, what we'll see is businesses will move to the country that has the, the least regulations, which means pollution and all those other issues will be concentrated there, as well as the exploitation of workers. And this creates challenges um, in terms of maintaining our middle classes in Canada, in Japan, in the United States. I mean, what's happened to the United States over the past four or five years is really related to the middle class being hollowed out. Free trade agreements weren't made thinking about the middle class. How can we keep them um, involved in the economy, keep them being able to have families, upskill, educate themselves? Um, and ideas such as the TPP, I'll call it that, are really meant to try and level the, pl the playing field for trade and make it rules-based. And that's really critical. And Canada wants to do that with China, with Japan, with South Korea, with Southeast Asian countries and India. And of course, the region's critical because this is where three out of four of the biggest and most populated countries in the world are China, India, and Indonesia. Um, this is where things are going to move. This is where the next consumers are. This is where the next demand for agricultural products is going to be. And if we're not part of that, and we're not ensuring that the region um, develops based on rules, we're going to be locked out of it. And in that sense, I think if we're not at the table, we're on the menu. And it's so critical to be part of this um, concept of building a free and open Indo-Pacific. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, I, I love this phrase, uh, uh, rules-based order. So it's very counterintuitive for those who are maybe interested in new kinds of markets, uh, things that are quote unquote gray. But whenever you have regulation, like if we're talking about like marijuana or casinos or cryptocurrency, whenever any kind of news of regulation comes out, it's, it's always good because um, that creates kind of a benchmark and uh, it, it creates a playing field where people can actually participate and it becomes real, a real market. So yeah, yeah, that's that's really interesting um, to see that uh, you're working on kind of like helping to educate and spread that uh, in in the Indo-Pacific area and everything. Yeah, it was really interesting because I think the Japanese scholars, one uh, Akiko Fukushima from Aoyama, which is a, a super smart lady. Um, you know, those people that complain about Japan not having smart, talented women. This is one of those amazing women. Yeah, she came out and talked about Japan and and Canada cooperation, security in the region. And she came out there, you know, with her fist punching and, and had some really amazing comments about why we should be thinking about cooperation, why it's critical to foster rules based order. And think about it. We're having this discussion. So if I was speaking Korean and you're speaking Chinese and you're speaking um, um, English, it's not going to be a very good conversation, right? We're not going to be able to have and talk about things as broad as 311 to this particular concept to our next topic. And that's this idea of rules-based order. And, and Professor Fukushima did a great job at this. Um, we also had Professor Urata Shujiro, a really prominent economist in Japan. And he talked about this in the, in the context of the BRI and infrastructure connectivity building on the BRI and how it's problematic. It's not transparent, often not sustainable. 
it creates dependency relationships. This is a problem, right? Where I think the FOAP concept of infrastructure connectivity is based on transparency, environmental friendliness, fiscally sustainable. So there's a lot of really interesting um, ways to be thinking about this free and open. But I think, again, it goes back to rules-based, transparency, um, common understanding of how to behave in the international arena. You know, you mentioned the BRI, or the Belt and Road Initiative, which is, you know, really China's uh, big project in sort of trying to have a larger role in pan-Asian policy. And they've really partnered with a lot of developing countries throughout Southeast Asia into Central Asia and around this concept of building the new Silk Road. But as you said, there are a lot of questions about the sustainability and also the lack of transparency in some of these initiatives. And of course, there are a lot of reports about how it might be a debt trap that China is setting for these developing countries. Yeah, I think that's true, Parker. But, um, you know, the model of the BRI is, you know, you export overcapacity. So you build a, you build a lot of steel and cement and other products in China. And then you export that to your destination country. So whatever country that is. And then you also export labor from China. So I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has really caused a challenge to that model because no longer can you export labor, no longer can you export um, overcapacity to build that infrastructure connectivity. So it suggests that there's going to be a need to uh, rethink this, this the, the BRI model. But it's changing. And I think um, the more you study about it, you see that this FOIP idea and BRI seem to be reactive. They engage with each other. And um, Japan's focus on uh, transparency, fiscal sustainability, environmental sustainability and friendliness, these are themes that are now being picked up by, by the BRI. So I think the BRI is something, it's a project in, in development and will probably, probably a change in five or 10 years if it's still around. And FOAP as well will probably continue to change as, as, as think, needs on the ground change. And I think the biggest change we'll see for FOAP is probably there's going to be a health pillar that's focusing on building health infrastructure um, within the region. Because, you know, you can't develop and pro- promote development unless you're focusing on building healthy societies as well. That's a good point. Well, you know, we can't talk about Asian policy without mentioning the situation in Myanmar. And I think we touched upon it briefly. But Stephen, I'm sure you've been watching this. What do you think is going to happen with Myanmar? I speak to a lot of people on the ground, uh, friends in Myanmar, um, experts um, in in Myanmar and in Southeast Asia. And I think overall, people are very pessimistic. Um, They're pessimistic about... um, the grassroots campaign in Myanmar to be able to push back against the uh, junta. Um, They don't have the power. um, They don't have the sources. And I think there's concerns that outside parties are supporting the military government to ensure that it keeps in power. You know, for some countries that are authoritarian states within the region, the last thing they want to see is a people's movement that overthrows uh, a, a military junta or an authoritarian state. Um, so that's a kind of an un- unfortunate take home. Another take home is in terms of Southeast Asia and its cohesiveness. Is Southeast Asia able to solve this problem? And at this stage, the answer is is no. You know, Thailand has a semi-authoritarian government led by a military government. The last thing they're going to do is interfere in Myanmar. Laos and Cambodia are client states of China. So they're not going to interfere in, in, in um, Myanmar. Philippines, under President Duterte, was tilted towards authoritarianism, has no interest in voicing any view about promoting democracy. Um, so what, what, where does that leave um, Southeast Asia as, as a unit, so-called ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, in terms of dealing with Myanmar? And I think that their hands are really tied um, because they're not a unified unit on, on most things, and in particular... Um, thinking about what to do with Myanmar. Um, lastly is, you know, you know, the, I, often I think the United States has said, well, the United States should do something. What can the United States do, right? If they put sanctions on the Myanmar regime, you know, what that's going to do is push the, the military government towards China. Um, 
China, on the other hand, well, I think that they could do a lot to push back against、um, this coup because they were friendly with the military and An Suki, the dem- democracy leader there.、Um, the question is, do they want to do that? And it goes back to that point.、Um, you know, China's long term、uh, core foreign policy is that、um, we protect our sovereignty and we believe in non interference. And, you know, by pressuring Myanmar in any way, it challenges their core. Foreign policy premises. So, both China and the United States are probably not going to be productive partners in changing the dynamics there. So, where does Myanmar move forward? And I think it really will depend on the bravery of ordinary Myanmar people. And、um, this is something that's fascinating to watch because the anti coup people are really broadly spread through all parts of society business people. Um, government workers,、uh, students, small business owners. And, you know, they've been out there on the streets every day、uh, pushing back and, and dying for their cause.、Um, let's hope that they can find a peaceful solution, but、um, it doesn't look good at this stage. You mentioned the three fingers、uh, before we started.、Uh, do you have anything to yeah, mention yeah, about that? Yeah, so I thought this was an、uh, inspiring story. So this week,、um, the former. Um, Myanmar、um, chief diplomat to the United Nations was speaking to the United Nations. And、um, he's actually a university,、uh, International University of Japan graduate, which I, I, I thought that was great. But、um, he raised three fingers at the meeting in his discussion.、Uh, and he explicitly said and asked the international community to push back against this military coup、uh, and try to help reestablish、um, the rightful democratic. Uh, leaders of Myanmar. And I thought that was something really, really impressive. And the three fingers means resistance.、Um, and, you know, he, of course, he lost his position right away, but he's still speaking on behalf of the Myanmar people, not the government, in terms of trying to represent their interests and push back against、um, this coup.、Um, so, going back to that story, so this diplomat, and I think it It says something about Japan's ability to bring in and change some of the politics domestically in the region, but Japan is very proactive in bringing in mid level public servants in programs such as the Japanese Development Scholarship. So they'll come to my university or the International University of Japan or Todai or whatever university, and they're trained for two years and sometimes five years, ma- masters and a PhD in public policy or international relations or development. And then they go back to their home countries and Work in their governments. And I think that that time here exposes them to a free and open society,、mm. to liberal democratic values. And, and I'm, I'm not saying Japan is a perfect democratic society. No country is a perfect democratic society. But、um, that time here, just like you and I and Aaron, we spent time here, we're influenced by the values,、um, by democracy here,、um, by how things work. And you can see it play on the international stage. And There's a lot of students from Myanmar that have studied here. And what's interesting, many of them share that, that more progressive view about how Myanmar should move in the future. You know, another interesting example of that、uh, Kim Jong un's older brother, he spent a lot of time, where was it?、Uh, somewhere, somewhere in Europe.、Uh, Switzerland? Yeah, he, he, he was educated in Switzerland. And、um, yeah, Kim, Kim Jong nam. Um, and、uh, he was infamous for many reasons,、uh, but one of the re- less infamous p- aspects of his past is he was educated in Switzerland, which g i v e him a sense of what's out there in the international community. But you know, Kim Jong un, the Secretary, Secretary General of, of the Workers' Party in North Korea, was also educated in Switzerland. So I think that you know, <laughs> we can take this either way. But、um, Kim Jong nam, the older brother that was killed with sarin gas, right? Sarin poison.、Mm-hmm. Um, in Malaysia, well, you know, he spent a lot of time through Southeast Asia、um, because he didn't want to be part of this authoritarian state of North Korea. So, yeah, that experience outside in a free and open world、um, does affect、uh, how we think about the directions of countries. You know, it's、uh, interesting a story of two brothers growing up in Switzerland. One learned about the greatness of democracy, the other learned about the greatness of chocolate. <laughs> Chocolate, probably.、Uh, what does Swiss drink? Swiss, Swiss wine?、Uh, do they drink some kind of cognac or something? I, when I think about like Germany and Switzerland, I think schnapps, about the schnapps, yeah, schnapps, schnapps, yeah. schnapps, schnapps, schnapps.、Yeah. He probably has a taste for schnapps. I just found this out recently, but Kim Jong un's older brother was the rightful heir 
Correct. Yes. Um, yeah, which is kind of wild. The Kim regime is fascinating and their roots with Japan are also interesting. And uh, perhaps that's a different discussion on a different day. Um, but um, yeah, the Kim Jong-un and his family have a fascinating history with Japan, despite uh, them trying to sanitize that past. You know, we can't talk about uh, imperfect democracies without talking about the one that uh, Aaron and I are from. Uh, Last time we spoke late last year, uh, Biden had just won the U.S. presidency. Now it's been two months into the Biden administration, and the Biden administration has already made waves with this new Biden-era Asia policy. What do you think about Biden's Asian policy and the administration's recent comments regarding China's aggressive behavior in the region? So I, um, I think that in general, the Biden administration has much more continuity with the Trump administration in terms of its Indo-Pacific views and Indo-Pacific outlook and its policies towards China. And that may surprise many people that are listening to this, but uh, the hard line on China pressing on human rights such as Xinjiang and the national security law in Hong Kong, um, pressing on intellectual property rights and unfair trade, pressing China on tech and trying to stop tech transfers. These are all a continuation of of Trump era policies. The biggest difference is I think that um, the Biden administration is much more focused on uh, multilateral cooperation, working within international institutions regaining uh, trust of allies by rejoining the World Health Organization, by being an advisor on the Human Rights Council for the United Nations, um, by rejoining the Paris Climate Accords. These are all great signals to allies and partners. And the Biden administration in the context of of Japan has stood up for um, Japan's um, position on the Senkaku Islands and that that the Senkaku Islands pertain and will be protected under their Article Nine of their alliance. They've stood up to the South Korea. Uh, they've stood up for the South Koreans and the Moon administration in terms of dealing with North Korea. In Taiwan, they've had a, quite a strong and positive position with Taiwan, inviting the representative to the United States of Taiwan to his inauguration. So a lot of really strong signals about continuity. But I think it's a much smarter. Uh, coordinated, strategic, and uh, uh, less chaotic approach. And I think that allies within the region are looking at this, um, and I think they're very comfortable with the shift. There's still worries that, you know, this progressive liberal agenda of the far left in the United States may um, pull the Biden administration away from a a proactive approach within the region. And in particular for Japan, you know, they have a, a... you know, they don't have a lot of um, options within the region. It's the US, uh, U.S.-Japan alliance, which is the cornerstone of their security in the region. So for them, they really worry that um, the progressive left could pull the Biden administration away from a very proactive approach within the region. On the other hand, I think that what's come with the Biden administration um, has also come with something that I'm concerned about personally, is the silencing of the former president on social media, um, you know, I, I watch CNN, BBC, but he's not on there anymore. And, I, you know, I'm not a, a, a fan of the president, but uh, it's a bit disturbing that he's lost platforms to communicate in public. Um, we don't want to live in an authoritarian state where businesses or um, make a proactive choice about who can talk and what they can talk about. And I'm a bit concerned about that. Um, and I think the Biden administration is going to have to think about this very carefully because if he's not reelected, this could happen to him. And it's something to think about this. A lot of good has come with the Biden administration, but I think um, we've had some reactions to the former president that's not been, not been positive as well. Yeah. I think the silencing of our former president um, on behalf of the media and big tech, especially raises a lot of questions Uh, particularly should big tech have this much power and why, why at that time did they choose to silence him? Because really, you know, when when Twitter, Twitter was the big one, when they finally blocked his account that had a major impact on not just his presidency, but his entire platform and his 
livelihood and his family and everything. Um, so, you know, I think America really needs to have a deep reflection, both in the private sector and public sector on the power of these tech companies. And this is going on to some extent. We see lots of these, you know, hearings before Congress with the CEOs of most recently Robin Hood. Um, and then, you know, obviously from Facebook and whatnot. Um, personally, they seem to <laughs> kind of be meaningless from my perspective, more just entertainment value. We love we love putting on a good show in the States, you know, <laughs> so I think that's part of it. But um, I'm a huge proponent of uh, really taking some of the power away from these big tech companies, which are really media companies in a way. Um, Facebook denies it. Uh, all the time, but they are absolutely a media company in my eyes and the, one of the most powerful advertisers in the world. Yeah, this, uh, I, I just, the more that you think about it, you see the silencing of certain voices. And I, I, again, I don't support the, the views, um, but how do we create more critical thinkers about media and cons- media consumption without having a more balanced set of presentations about ideas, right? And, you know, in the Japanese case, you know, you, you don't see, for example, those, those um, people that are in favor of protecting Article 9 communicating around the same table or in the same media platform about those that think that there's time to have a revision of the Constitution. They don't talk, they don't talk right? So they become echo chambers silos of people that just agree with each other's views and that does not that doesn't do any good for ordinary citizens so whether it's japan or whether it's united states or canada or alabama um i mean we really need different voices out there and i think this is something i'm concerned about under the biden administration so far is that um, we need to find ways to get sides to communicate together yeah, it's really difficult. You're, I mean, I think what you're, you're kind of talking about also kind of reflects that across the world, policy discussions really happen just in the academy and sort of in these ivory towers and spheres of influence. And these important discussions don't make headlines because the public is just not educated about what's going on. And I think this is sort of been the way that things have always been in, you know, policy making communities, but with the open and free nature of information sharing in the digital age, you would hope that more people would be open to talking about policy and we could use the internet as a way to educate people better about what's going on in our communities and the important and divisive policy decisions that happen in both domestic politics and international relations. But people are more interested in talking about, you know, the Kardashians and, uh, you know, all the other Megan, shit. Megan Marlowe being bad talk by the, the firm. <laughs> <laughs> well, and these kinds of things, too, are optimized by the algorithms that the platforms are on to be shown to as many people as possible because the algorithm, you know, is trying to get more people to react, to engage with the posts. And the more controversial, the more chaotic the information is, the more popular it's going to be. So we do not, and in, 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 in no way is any of these social media platforms an unfiltered, free and open public discussion. It is extremely filtered. It is extremely controlled. You know, um, someone who has a thousand friends on Facebook uh, uh, some of their posts may only get six views, right? So that's because Facebook is controlling how many people see certain things based on the content. Um, and this is all being decided by AIs now, right? Um, humans aren't even Those doing damn it. AIs, <laughs> but I mean, the AIs are created by humans, right? But, um, uh, we, we, we don't really have, don't want to jump into clubhouse, but um, <laughs> when's Trump going to get on clubhouse? <laughs> oh my God. See, see, that would be nuts. Um, uh, that would probably be the end of clubhouse actually. <laughs> but, Think you know, about it. Trump and Elon Musk talking about space <laughs> and Paris Hilton <laughs> <laughs> and MC hammer space force. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was in a, in a room with MC hammer and Paris Hilton and a bunch of, uh, blockchain developers talking what sort about- of uh, public policy. Were they talking about? Uh, NFTs, <laughs> <laughs> the new the new buzzword. We won't, won't won't go down there, but yeah, you know, we we really don't have um, a nice open public forum right now 
uh, that optimizes the community to find truth, which I feel like in the early days of the internet, that's what it was. It was a lot of academics um, just sharing information, looking for feedback on their work to find something but you know, even not, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to push back that because I think the, even academics they they live in bubbles, they live in silos, right? And academic community, there's people like me that are involved in the policy community, and the people that are not, right? And they're just in theory and methods, and they really are in the ivy towers. That's a different kind of thinking. Um, so I think um, how we think about issues, we need to model how to communicate about whatever issue. So you asked me about the Biden administration and giving, kind of giving him a kind of grade, and I think he's done well on some issues. But as I said, I think on things like um, freedom of speech, um, it's a troublesome first six weeks. And I, I, I'm not sure, um, I, I think he should be out there speaking about this, even though he has different views than the previous uh, occupant of the White House. So, um, you know, how do we create that space, right? And I think that goes back to an aspect of the free and open is you have to have a free space and an open space, but it also has, it has to be rules-based, right? You know, the question is who makes the rules? And, um, you know, that, you know, as you said, you know, Facebook making the rules or Twitter making the rules, well, they're a business. Um, you know, they're representing the corporate stakeholders. Uh, they're not representing ordinary citizens or the government. And that's a big question. You know, thinking about the communications implications for the U.S. presidency, I think one of the things that I've seen as sort of a depressing trend in how the new presidency has been communicating, I, I pose this question to everyone. Can you remember anything that President Biden has said thus far since becoming president? Hmm. No, he hasn't done any of those, you know, where he signs the uh, affidavit document and shows it to everyone, has he? Nope. He hasn't posted any of those videos, has he? You know, I was really impressed with his speech the other day on the um, commemorating the 500,000 U- United States citizens that have died because of COVID-19. And he spoke for maybe 10 minutes and he talked about the the pain of the loss and his own, how he could empathize because, you know, he's lost his son, he lost his first wife, I think he lost another child. Um, you know, he's somebody that I think has skills to, to empathize. So I think that is something that's really memorable to me. Um, I think that he's been also very clear about the situation with his daily briefings or he has briefings, I don't can't remember how many times a week about what's happening with his policies. Uh, in that sense, I think he's been a pretty clear communi- communicator about the pandemic. You know, I think, again, this is going back to grading Biden, and it's only been five weeks, six weeks, but, you know, where is Harris in this? Um, he needs to provide opportunity for, for her to be out there on the forefront communicating to issues um, because she potentially could be uh, the next president, right? And uh, he needs to find a, a place where she's communicating these issues, not just um, Joe. Um, and that's, again, that's part of the report card, and we should be able to have those hard discussions uh, about, you know, what is, how is he cultivating the next potential president? Uh, because, you know, it's a heartbeat away, in, in one, or if he steps down, or whatever the situation is. So um, you're right, there's, uh, he should be out there, but he also needs to create space for um, uh, Vice President Harris to start to get that experience communicating. Well, you know, we can't talk about divisive issues and misinformation without talking about the Tokyo 2020 Olympics and Paralympics. You know, we're coming up on five months until these games are supposed to start rolling out and being this spectacle for the world to see, whether it's in person or not, is still up for question. There is lots of talk right now, a lot of rumors spreading around. Are the games going to happen? Will international spectators be allowed into Japan to watch the games? Stephen, have you been following this? Yeah, I, I'm following it. And I think that what we've seen over, you know, Tokyo has been um, focused on ha- having the Olympics after it was postponed. And I think they've gone through a process of finding different ways to test how they could hold the event 
So, you know, we've had sporting events here. We do have crowds here. They wear masks. It's not a full arena. I think they look at less, uh, lessons such as the Melbourne Open uh, that took place just uh, over the past two weeks. How did they bring in athletes? How did they quarantine them? How did they uh, ensure that they, they didn't bring COVID into to Australia? And Australia did pretty well. Um, they didn't do perfectly, but I think Japan's been looking at this as always to ensure that if they hold an event that, one, they can have audience members. Maybe it's only people living in Japan. Um, or bring a limited capacity of, of people from overseas to come in. Uh, and I think they need to continue to work on these methods. I am, I'm convinced they're going to have the Olympics. Um, the question is, is what is the form? You know, how, Who's going to be the audience? Um, how are they going to manage the athletes? Uh, how are they going to manage the coaches and the media? And um, these questions I think they can iron out over the coming months. Um, I've seen some interesting reports where teams are considering coming now, getting acclimatized and spend the next four or five months living in Japan so they don't have to do the quarantine just before the events. So that means they can train. You know, the COVID situation here, despite hovering around 200 a day, is much better than many countries, right? Definitely better than the country that Aaron and I are from. Yeah. You know, Tokyo has about 40 million people, right, in the broader Kanto area and 220 people that's not a lot of infections, right? Mm, it's pretty damn good. Yep. <laughs> what, what do you guys think about the, uh, the Olympics and the prospects? Well, I think what you just said, the scenario where they come early, I mean, that's what we would see in a normal Olympic scenario. Um, even reporters coming as early as a year before, get climatized, you know, get networked into the local area. As far as how the Olympics are going to go down, I think if they do happen, it'll be on a scale and a level that is going to be quite disappointing. I don't think they're going to have uh, many international spectators. What would really be cool if Japan was really fast and progressive and like highly technologically advanced, we could maybe do some like cool VR stuff and, you know, watch the Olympics in VR from your home. And, you know, there would be companies already in Japan getting that kind of stuff ready, but I don't think we're going to see anything like that. Is the Olympics a big show? I, 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 how many Olympics did you spend two weeks watching? Where was the last Olympics? Do you remember? Rio. Rio. Did you the spend a lot of time Olympics. watching it? Nope. I didn't, but I have a lot of friends who are like obsessed with sports, um, like yeah, back in back in Orlando and some here in Japan, and they will they will watch every day, you know, all the different games and and then you know they become like experts in a certain game just because like they read about it on Wikipedia. Curling, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, that's one of Canada's national sports. Um, but like when the, when we hosted the rugby event last last year or now a year and a half ago, that was amazing, and I could relate because it was all teams, right? You had all the, you know, the great events and and you know the those people on the train, you know, they would go around the Yamanote line and have parties and things. It was great. Um, but the Olympics has so many sports, and I just don't know who's playing and what they're playing and what game it is. And it's like a true show, like you know, it's like one of those shows you go to. You don't really know who's going to be playing, and then all of a sudden, like I don't know, like Celine Dion is like singing while like Hans Zimmer is like playing some crap, and it's like, wow, this is really weird, and I never would have expected this, but I guess this is cool, and some people really like that. Yeah, well, I think the Tokyo Olympics, you know, it was it was never going to be the thing that everybody was watching. And I think that perhaps the fervor around the games was a little bit overboard to begin with. I mean, this has really been the most expensive games that were ever planned. And that was before the pandemic. And now they're going to cost twice as much. So are they going to happen I think absolutely. I mean, the Japanese government and the major sponsors have spent so, so, so much money on trying to make this happen. And especially the government has really, you know, spent so much political capital on, you know, making these games happen and getting a postponement versus a cancellation of the 2020 Olympics. I think, you know, by all means necessary, they're going to make these games happen. And it's definitely going to be something like we've never seen before. And of course, not in the uh, positive sense in all terms, but 
The reality is, is that most people don't come to watch an Olympics in person and all of the, or most of the revenue isn't from selling tickets. It's from TV rights. And right, right. I think, you know, people should not forget this when they're thinking about, will these games happen? I think they'll absolutely happen and they'll be broadcast around the world and the people who watch it will have a great time. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But I think there's other, you know, calculations behind this. The IOC, you know, the International Olympic Committee, if they kibosh this, if they cancel this, which city going forward is going to be willing to put out this much money to potentially have the Olympics canceled? And the next city is supposed to be Paris. Um, no city is going to jump on board if there's a potential to cancel this. Um, so I think this is a really, really big issue. Um, and I think, you know, the friends of Japan, the G8 or G7, they all want this to happen. They're all, they won't want a successful Olympics. It's, you know, coming out of the COVID-19 era party, right? And they want the athletes to come here. They want to celebrate a successful democratic response to um, the Olympics. And, you know, the geopolitics of this is really, really big. And, uh, you know, it's a big driver behind the decision to push forward. And whether it's the Americans, the Canadians, the Australians, the French, the Germans, um, South Koreans, they all want this to happen because it, it provides different opportunities for different issues. Well, and it's funny you mentioned the uh, next Olympics being in Paris because the next Summer Olympics, yes, will happen in Paris in 2024. But before that, we have a Winter Olympics. And yes, that's happening in China. And of course, there are already rumors saying that one of the reasons that Tokyo is so gung-ho about making these games happen is to thumb their nose at China because, you know, Japan loves doing that. Because, you know, we all hate each other here in East Asia. Uh, I, I think it's less about 2020 Winter Olympics and I think more about upstaging the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party. That's on July 23rd, um, the opening ceremony for the postponed Summer Olympics. And I think that Tokyo and many other countries would love to have the spotlight on a successful Tokyo Olympics uh, than on the 100th anniversary of the CCP. Is that on the same day? The same day of the opening ceremony. Whoa. Oh. Damn. It's but a conspiracy. If I had to bet, though, man, the 100th anniversary of the C CCP, that's going to take all the attention. What do you guys think? Uh, domestically in, in China, of course, that will be on every channel. Um, and there'll be preparations for months ahead. Um, pre a bit of a problem with the uh, TVs. Uh, yeah. The Olympics just isn't, you know, coming in. So check out this ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. You've got it, right? That this is uh, something really important for the party there. And um, and they're going to make sure that the, it, they send the signals that, you know, they are single-handedly responsible for um, China's success of the COVID, China's economic growth and everything else. Um, but um at the same time, if when the Olympics happen, they have to send a team here. They have to send some of the media here. Um, they have to find ways to tell this Chinese story about the Olympics. And it, it will be uh, a focus on Japan and a focus on sport and a focus on the international community coming together. And that is a very significant signal to um, the region uh, that there's, there's also another star in the region. I mean, do you guys remember the 2008 Beijing Olympics opening ceremony? It's pretty amazing with the footsteps in the sky and, and that, the little girl that lip synced. And there was, yeah, and they, yeah, they had the footstep in the sky and they had this like circular sphere thing and there was a globe and they were like walking around it because they were on cables. And I had a lot of friends text me while that was going on. Dude, you have to turn on the TV now and watch this. I'm like, whatever. Like I, I wasn't interested in the Olympics. And yeah, like everyone else was like, holy shit. I felt like that uh, with the 2012 Olympics in London and you had like this spectacle where they had someone who looked like the queen jump out of a helicopter with James Bond. And <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys see that? That was crazy. Even, even that wasn't the queen? <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> and it was the real James Bond too, you know, the spy. Uh, but this, this is, this is the, the, that's the point. It's a big, big show, right? And mm -hmm. it brings people together and we all have disparate memories of these things. But, um, you know, a lot of people love these big ceremonies. And, and, and of course, there's the keynote um, events like the 100, 100 man or 100 meter dash 
just can't say man, right? Uh, 100, 100 meter dash and things like this, which everybody's interested, right? It's easy to understand who's the fastest person on the planet. Mm. Um, it's, uh, you know, these are things that I think easy, easy to relate. Yeah, it's uh, turning out to be a, a really divisive and important year. I mean, I think uh, after 2020, everyone was just ready for 2020 to end. But of course, 2021 is definitely a continuation of a lot of the problems that we've been facing over the past year. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens next. Sure. And when uh, the vaccines are out, what will happen to the economy? You'll probably have a, a big explosion of consumption as everybody's not been buying. Um what will happen to, I think, you know, many countries that once the vaccine goes online, that we're going to have huge economic growth, consumption, people out and about, um, you know, some, some people have written that it's going to be like the roaring twenties. I've seen that. I've seen that written. Sex, in a couple. drugs, rock and roll, baby making, artistic expression, and creativity. Um, Stop it. You're making me feel all like enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Aaron? Put yeah. your mask back on. Yeah. In the creative space, especially amongst musicians, I mean, it's blowing up right now. Uh, anybody who hasn't been making music is making music now. There's so much new music coming out. Statistically speaking, there's so many people making music. So lots of creative expression. I won't get into it, but we've got NFTs now, which are supposed to really help drive a lot of visual and... Um, uh, other other artists as well. Aaron, are you talking about the non fungible tokens? <laughs> mm, that, that's correct. <laughs> wow, internet money is going to be awesome. We have to say that for another episode. Yeah, because I had no idea what you were talking about there. Thank you, Parker, for explaining that. It's on the blockchain, man. We're going to go to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's the enthusiasm you have to have coming into it. But it has some really cool applications, which we'll talk about on a later episode. But again, uh, thank you so much, Stephen, for coming back on Tokyo Wave. And uh, I'm definitely waiting for some roaring 20s to happen. Roaring 20s for the three of us. Wouldn't that be great? That'd be awesome. We're going to go to the cabaret. It's going to be awesome. We need some like roaring 20s music, like with the brass band. <laughs> great, great Gapsy kind of. Uh, yes. yes. That was a great movie, right? What a good movie. If that's what it's like post COVID 19, I'm all for it. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> and then we go to war. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys, for a great, great opportunity to chat. Um, lots of important things from 311 to Indo Pacific to censorship on Twitter to uh, the Roaring Twenties. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stephen. Hey, listeners, that's right. You, you listen right there. Who do you think should be our next guest on Tokyo Wave? Let us know. Drop us a line at wave at tokyowave.jp. We hope you enjoyed Tokyo Wave. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Join us again next week on Tokyo Wave. 